good afternoon to all of you. I'm very pleased to be here in my old Fluch, uh, uh, my old team, and I feel very much at home even if we are in different premises. Uh, and that also means that I felt at liberty not to comply to the invitation and talk about Freud as a great thinker, because frankly, uh, I do not think that the great thinker approach is sufficiently fruitful. It's more interesting to look at thinkers in their social habitat, in their competition and association with other minor thinkers, and out of this uh, process came one as a intellectual hero, while there were so many around him who were also extremely meaningful. And of course, I'm jealous of great thinkers. I owe that much to Freud uh, to confess my hidden feelings. And it will all be all about hidden feelings this afternoon. Uh, as a matter of fact, I didn't write very much about Freud. In fact, I read only one article, wrote only one article about him, and we will talk about it. Can you hear me even when I'm roaming around? Yeah, OK. Uh, you tell me when I'm roaming around too far. Uh, so, and then I wrote six small pieces in the in the newspaper called, at some point, uh, uh, re encountering psychoanalysis. But I want to start with an article which I wrote about Freud for the Elias Figurational Studies. Uh, Association. It was in a, a volume which was called Human Figurations in 1977. And it was about the psychoanalytical situation, setting is the English word all the non English speakers use, but situation is the English word, the psychoanalytic setting. Uh, and I wrote about it because it was a rather unique discovery for which Freud is rarely credited. Freud discovered a new social situation, a situation which had not existed before and to my knowledge does not exist outside psychoanalysis, which was the psychoanalytic situation, uh, which with some of you may be familiar, it is more or less the same as the pre contemporary uh, uh, psychotherapeutic sessions, very much similar. Uh, but Freud came to this, his gradual uh, definition of the psychoanalytic situation, uh, very much as a young doctor of his days, in the uh, latter uh, years of the 19th century, at a time when medical doctors were very much involved in establishing their profession and themselves as practitioners who deserve the respect and the prestige of their clientele. And that meant that there was sort of a prestige struggle between rather wealthy patients and doctors, whether he, the doctor should visit the patient at his home or her home, or whether the patient, if she or he was not that ridden, should come and vi visit the doctor at his office hours, Audienzstunde. Uh, there was a little struggle going on about it, and doctors for some reason won the struggle. And uh, It is less and less common for doctors to visit patients at home unless they are actually that ridden. So, I remember I wrote in that article of 1977 that that was because doctors had more medical instruments to carry around uh, and that there were more effective therapies which may increase their prestige. Now I'm not so sure whether that is true, whether there were that many effective therapies which increased their prestige, but I'm quite convinced that doctors succeeded one way or another in increasing their prestige and demarcating their distance to a lower social <coughs> breed of people, which were craftsmen who also provided services, 
uh, but who were held in low esteem by the higher bourgeoisie and the, uh, let me say, noble families of Vienna, because we're talking mostly about Vienna. Doctors had another practice. They used to travel or ride about town and make themselves very visible in order to gain a clientele. And Freud was, with his newly established family, was very much in a position that he had to find clients because, as his older friend Royer said, uh, the alternative is to immigrate and you won't have much chance uh, as a young neurologist, medical practitioner abroad. So he was up against the wall in a way. And he figured, as a matter of fact, I'm, this, most of these data come from uh, handbooks for doctors, for medical practitioners of the time, where doctors were told how to behave and what to do. Uh, also, modern handbooks at the time said, don't fidget around with money. Demand a fixed uh, fee. A and doctors were loath to do that because that was the practice of craftsmen who were so close to them uh, as in social prestige and they wanted to distantiate themselves by dealing with financial matters as something uh, embarrassing for cultivated people of social standing. You wouldn't talk about money and you would leave it to the largesse of your patron and uh, you would be willing to wait until the whole therapy was over. Uh, people were about as difficult and embarrassed with money as lecturers in academia are today. I never mentioned the subject, you know, uh, because it is beneath our dignity as academics and intellectuals to bother about money. So uh, we may be among the last, and I'm not talking about your generation. Uh, so, Freud decided to be a, a rather, uh, uh, to be a non-conformist and to make his reputation as a man who insisted on his patients visiting him at his, his office hour, who was absolutely without embarrassment or shame about money, which in his position, I would clearly say I demand this much money and it has to be paid uh, after each session or whatever. And there was a double embarrassment about it, because not only did doctors not talk about money, but the anti-Semitic prejudice, which was rampant in Vienna, well, I don't have to finish, you all know it, how come you know? Okay, you don't know. The uh, anti-Semitic prejudice was that Jews were especially greedy about money, so he had a double reason to be embarrassed about uh, money. Uh, he was strict about time. After an hour, 60 minutes, he would call it to, to an end. Uh, and all this was basically in the line of the restructuring of the medical profession by young doctors. Uh, led by the authors of handbooks and professors who told them how to establish themselves. Uh, and in this audience stunde, in this office hour, he uh, firstly applied hypnosis and he touched the patient. That was why the patient was supposed to lie down and, and, and uh, uh, re relax. Uh, and then the idea came to him that you didn't even need to touch a patient to hypnotize. And then the idea came to him that you don't even have to hypnotize a patient who is lying in the couch on a couch. And it all will come uh, rather spontaneously. So less he, uh, this, this office hour, this psychoanalytic setting, is structured by less and less elements introduced by the psychotherapist. And those par parameters, parameters that might be a subject of discussion or of hesitation had been set very strictly ahead of time by Sigmund Freud. And then came the idea that 
if you let the patient talk, the talking cure it was called, he or she, there are many she's, uh, some of the greatest patients of course are young Viennese ladies who have contributed to the discovery of, of psychoanalysis. Uh, the idea came to, for, for the less you interfere, the less you say, the more a patient will talk and reveal some of her subconscious. Now this is one of the most difficult words in the history of human science. Whatever that may mean, Ellen Berger wrote a book about it called The Discovery of the Unconscious. And that was, that, that was somehow meaningful about, uh, uh, revealed something of her or his personality, and that it might help in some way to uh, at least uh, uh, solve the, the, the problems, uh, cure the symptoms the patient had presented. And Freud developed what he called the rule of free association. And free association was that you were supposed to say whatever came to your mind. <coughs> and initially, Freud insists that people really have to talk honestly and say what's in the mind, not hide anything, not beat around the bush, being completely straightforward. But increasingly, he felt that that was unnecessary. They didn't need to even tell it. people who just say whatever came to their mind. That is the, 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 the rule of free association, one of the defining characteristics of the psychoanalytic situation. And the complement of that rule is the uh, rule of abstinence, which is much more difficult. On the side of the therapist, it means that the therapist is not so, supposed to react in any way to what the patient says, except from time to time give a working hypothesis called an interpretation of what these words may have meant and how they may relate to what had been produced prior. Certainly the therapist and the patient should abstain from any kind of physical, material actions connected to whatever is being said during the hour. So you could say something like, well, let me say something innocent. I would love to take that pipe of yours which is on the cabinet. And you're not, he's not supposed to say, you keep your dirty hands off my pipe. I'm taking, I didn't intend to, but it's already heavily for you. <laughs> symbolism. So it also shows you don't need me to tell you about Freud as a great thing. You already know about pipes. Uh, we lost our innocence. You can't even talk about pipes anymore. <laughs> Good. So the patient wasn't, could say, yes, I would like to smoke the pipe. But he was not supposed to actually do it, nor was the therapist supposed to say, you keep your hands with it. Just, huh? So all there is in this situation are verbal uh, utterances and maybe here and there a little twitch or a tear or something. <laughs> That's the rule of abstinence, which is not simple at all. But what did this produce? This strange, very contrived, very artificial situation that Freud, over a number of years as a young practitioner, created. Actually, it is in a way the human interactional equivalent of a laboratory experiment. Basically, the psychoanalytic setting is a test tube, which has been carefully cleaned ahead of time. The, the ingredients are being put into it, and after a while something comes out of it, which can only be attributed to the ingredients and maybe the temperature of this little test tube. All other parameters have been <coughs> neutralized. And in Freud's thinking, gradually you see that his idea is, I create a situation in which what the patient produces, what the patient says, can only be attributed to the patient's personality, earlier, earlier experiences, 
emotional conflict and to no outward disturbance such as maybe my child uh, uh, running into the room naked and saying where is my whatever. There are no outward disturbance, double doors in old-fashioned psychoanalytic rooms. Uh, the, the, the therapist himself does nothing or is almost entirely passive. He has not, or she has not, induced the, the, the thoughts or the effort. So the, 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 the therapist remains detached, detached non-committal, amoral, and just listens to the patient, may ask for clarification sometimes, and should behave in every respect as a how to class, a wooden puppet. Here is one of the technical problems of psychoanalysis to this day, that this rule of abstinence, when strictly applied, makes you into an unfeeling automaton. Uh, imagine the patient coming in and saying, my mother died yesterday. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, she died yesterday. Yes, how does that feel? Yeah. That will be impossible. You're supposed to say something like, good heavens, what's, what's happened to something? Freud was very, in fact, Freud, although he wrote all these, these uh, famous, I'm mostly talking about the Ratschläge, advice to young practitioners of psychoanalysis, which I think is his best writing if you want to know how psychoanalysis works. They were written in the 10th of the 20th century. Uh, Freud himself was a rather uh, lively person who interfered with the cure all the time, who sometimes went to see his patients at, a, at dances or, or cafes, but Freud was Freud. So, but Freud was also, as you know, a neurologist who had his training, among others, in dissecting the nervous systems of fishes and had in the back of his mind the idea that in the end, maybe not the end of his life, but in the end, all these psychological conflicts could be reduced to neurological material phenomena. He abandoned that dream in the course of his life. He forgot about it, came back to it. And lo and behold, the present revival of psychoanalysis is exactly in association with neurologists who are talking about the very early formation of neural connections that may once and for all establish certain emotional paths and organize emotional experiences. There is actually an interesting revival of uh, precisely this psychoanalytic theory of very early childhood which has to do with these neurological ideas. He would have been very pleased had he known about it. So, the psychoanalytic situation is in a way a very scientistic construct. Uh, and that explains a whole lot. Of, now, what of Freud's uh, thinking? Certainly at the early times. Now, one of the things Freud discovered in this setting, and which I think is, are his second and third discoveries, which are more than most relevant for social science was what he called übertragung, transference literally, and its complement, which is much more problematical, gegenübertragung, counter-transference. What is transference? Freud thought uh, that his patients left to their own fantasies, their own devices, the free association, began to fantasize about the silence person behind the couch and attribute all sorts of peculiarities to the therapist that had were basically projections from their own early childhood and which, by the way, might not be entirely conscious. There's that word again, conscious. And I warned you, it's the most difficult word in the bunch. So patients are fantasizing about the, the, the uh, uh, therapist, and they are not entirely aware of what they are fantasizing. Um, 
we will talk a lot about sex and violence in, in, in this hour, because sex and violence have in common that the stakes for a person are very high. Uh, for example, if a person would talk about a sexual fantasy, or maybe a sexual occurrence days before, she or he might fantasize without entirely realizing it, that the therapist would get excited about that. But that's a very threatening idea, because the whole idea was that he was going to stay uh, out of the, the uh, that there was abstinence. But sexual fantasies can sometimes be very powerful for a person, uh, and the idea may be that the same powerful sexual fantasy, which has given me so much pleasure, might actually overwhelm the therapist. Overwhelm, that's a very good word for it dangerous feelings. So here is uh, a, 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 a terrain, a field of, of danger. Some of us, not you, have had sexual fantasies. Some, not you, have thought that those were very powerful and that if others would hear them, they would either be very, very indignant or they would suddenly be ablaze. And it is not so easy to so there are, and is it, are more or less conscious fantasies about what will happen if you speak. These fantasies, especially in as far as they are not entirely conscious, in as far as the, the, the patient doesn't realize them with so many words, uh, these unconscious fantasies about the therapist make up the transference. And they're very important because Freud had the idea that such transference fantasies about the therapist somehow wiederholen, I have to know this word in German, wiederholen, repeats early childhood experiences in many respects. Uh, and therefore, that if the transference can be at some point discussed, it may point to early social uh, traumas or very shocking experiences which have remained dormant and still f conflictful during the patient's lifetime. And therefore the transference is in a way the conveyor belt of very early conflictful childhood experiences in the present of the psychoanalytic situation. It gets a lot more complicated and interesting then Freud comes up with another term, a complementary term, called countertransference, gegenübertragung. Still is a very German science. Uh, uh, gegenübertragung. The funny thing is Freud only mentions this concept in passing, twice I think in the Ratschläge, hardly in the Vorlesung, maybe in later work. He mentions it and then he doesn't talk about it. What is Gegenübertragung? Gegenübertragung are the partly unconscious fantasies of the therapist, yet she too can fantasize about the patient. Um, well, the patient might be attractive in one sense or another, it happens. And is not supposed, because we have the rule of abstinence, there should be this should not be acted upon, it should preferably be, be put out of mind. The patient may be very successful in life and the therapist may be jealous. The patient may be frightened. So here are fantasies on the part of the psychotherapist concerning the patient. I'll give you an example, I've thought about it. Practically everything one can mention is somehow embarrassing and painful, and the example of countertransference, which I will give, comes from my own analysis. Uh, I was in, in hiding as a very young child during war years, and of course the, the, the analyst was aware of it, and I started fantasizing what my analyst might have done during the war when he was an adult which is a very interesting theme. All sorts of anxieties, all sorts of things may come out of these fantasies. 
Uh, and since I started fantasizing, I was not being overwhelmed by anxiety. Apparently, I trusted the guy sufficiently to think that he had not been with the SS. Otherwise, I might probably have, that, would have, that might have been a problem. So, but the analyst couldn't bear it. He could not bear having this young Jewish man fantasizing about him having been uh, a collaborator, uh, a traitor during the war. So he starts interfering with the analysis. He starts telling me, no, he had helped several Jews during the war. He goes even <laughs> further. He says he was angry at these Jews because he had to help them, which is a complicated sense of a feeling. He was simply talking right through the analysis. <laughs> the counter-transference was too much for him. It happens all the time. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, yes, there is something wrong with that. It's not. It's a uh, Kunstfehler. Uh, 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 how, well, how would you translate Kunstfehler? A professional error. But why? Of course, the, the, this was in the 70s. The war was not so long ago. It was a very heavy burden on this therapist. And simply, he, or he may have rationalized for himself that I otherwise would have been overwhelmed by anxiety. But there was no reason to think so. I would probably have stopped at the point that it became too much. But you can see how much is at stake. This is about war. It's about race. It's about violence, it's about anxiety. These are not minor things. And then I had a second analysis, and the second analyst did exactly the same thing. Uh, so that was too much for the psychoanalysts of the 70s. Uh, it would be interesting to try and think what today's therapists couldn't support. If a woman patient would accuse him of being a misogynist, that would be hard to bear. He probably would feel that he should say, no, 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 I'm a great friend of women and I admire it. <laughs> but you're not supposed to do that. That's not what it's all about. You're supposed to listen and to say, well, what if I were a misogynist? Can you tell me? And then she might say, no, can I shut up? Okay, then I, probably I would wait for the rest of the hour if she really would shut up. And then we would have to do something. But probably she talk. Um, so, now we have the discovery of transference and counter-transference, of which I think that they are totally essential in the social sciences, in field work, and in person-to-person -person <coughs> interviews, open interviews. And very important in judging, in critically evaluating, the validity of social science data. Let me give you an example of the first thing. I'm writing a book and I'm interested in statistics about female uh, uh, genital mutilation, FGM. Most of you are aware of what that means. And we have fantastic statistics about it. In most countries now it's outlawed. The law, laws have been passed against it and it is punishable by law. And lo and behold, the, the percentages of FMG are dropping like stones, going from 90% to 50% in Egypt, Senegal. Wonderful. But where the hell does that information come from? Who told them? How do you know? I'm just back from Senegal, which is a country in which FMG is very prevalent. And I have a, I imagine something. I imagine one of these sort of <coughs> motherly women sitting in front of her house, cleaning vegetables. And someone in, at a distance, she sees through the dusty Sahel atmosphere, appearing a young lady in a black skirt and a white blouse, carrying a notebook, and she's approaching, <coughs> and she got to have me. She's got to talk to me. Well, is obviously a lady from the city. She must have gone to school. Very important young lady. So I better answer her. I hope she speaks Wolof, but because my French is not very good. Well, it turns out she speaks Wolof. And what does she ask me? 
a totally, utterly impossible question. She wants to know what I look like down below. That's impossible. Uh, not only because it's utterly shameless, but also because the government has just prevaricated how you're supposed to look uh, below, whereas the, 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 the city, the, the village elders and the elderly women of the village think entirely differently about it. So this is an impossible interview. It cannot be held. So where do, do those figures come from? The United Nations figures, you better respect them. They must come from the United Nations thumb, which is somewhere in the basement of the United Nations. And what I mean is if you have a, let me say, Freudian eye for social science interactions, this, these are impossible interviews. This cannot work. There are ways there are ways to find out, but they're very time-consuming, they're very complicated, and they may be quite unreliable. So this is an invalid question. It cannot uh, convey believable figures. And then what did I find out in Senegal? That what we considered progressive policies, heavily subsidized by NGOs, especially feminist NGOs in the West, now, in Senegal, is considered Western post-colonial interference with our culture. Here we have Black Pete, there they have FMG. And FMG is a great part of Senegal heritage, and maybe we should change it a little bit. There's an argument for that. But the West is not going to tell us how to do it, and certainly not white ladies from America. So the whole thing is in an impossible knot. But remember, the stakes are high. And this is about a woman's body and about rather incisive, literally, measures taken uh, in a young girl's body and some dire consequences. What I'm saying is I try to imagine the, the, the professional interview as a situation in which mutual fantasies interfere with the production of valid data. Uh, I would say that is one of the uses of the idea of transference and counter-transference. counter-transference in interviews and field work. Generally, when we do field work, we are usually confronted with people who are, in many social dimensions, lower than we are. But we feel, or most of us feel, that there is no such thing as lower or higher as we do not want to think of it. And certainly, we wouldn't want to call ourselves in any way superior to our interviewees. But Chuck says you are. It's not for you to decide. That's what society has already decided. You have a degree, well, she has not. Uh, you have a ticket to fly back to Amsterdam, the young lady you're interviewing does not. You are white for the majority, she is black. Of course, for you it makes no difference, you're colorblind, but she is not. You're a man, she's a woman. Or you're a woman, she's a man. So in most situations when we work, and the same applies also to people in the Netherlands, when we work with our favorite subjects, and our favorite subjects are usually people who are less privileged than we are, and much more interesting to study, we find ourselves in a superior position, not of our, ma our own making, and in many ways not of our own thinking, because we resent so much these, these, these uh, racist and economic and ethnic and what have you uh, differentiations that we'd rather not think of it. 
but you didn't make them, and you cannot unthink them. And they are from the first moment on a major problem in the uh, recovery of valid data. How to go about it, I don't know. But it would be a good idea if you had the time to say nothing and see what she says and how she uh, uh, looks at the situation. And it would be a good idea to think long and hard and deep about your own thoughts and let me call them unthoughts, the thoughts you're trying not to think. Uh, and superiority is one of them which is very hard to deal with because you happen to be in an objective social situation which you cannot just... Uh, there is a, another thing. Many of us, when we do long interviews or field work, think that we should be grateful to our uh, subjects, to our informants, because they give us so much information. But if you do your job well, the respondent may think the opposite, that finally he or she has an opportunity to talk at length about her situation, about things that matter for him, with the idea, and this is very important, that the researcher will be discreet and reticent and shall not in any way uh, betray what's being said unless it is thoroughly anonymized. So you may be doing a great service to someone, for uh, providing the opportunity to speak freely uh, with in, conf in confidence. The first time that I had a chance to apply my no-found psychoanalytic knowledge, I was then a student of psychoanalysis at the Psychoanalytic Institute, was as a member of a team that did research in a cancer ward. And the members of the team were mostly, uh, let me say, senior psychoanalysts. And I was the field researcher and the reporter. Well, all sorts of things we, we did in that research. But I want to, to, uh, to evoke a particular situation. I used to stay in the hospital, even at night, for investigation. That's what I said, for umzuk, and for examination. So that, that was a rather ambivalent, ambiguous uh, rationale. And at some, one day I was in the women's ward in the, uh, for women with advanced stages of uh, uterine and, and breast cancer who were there sitting around in their robes and uh, having fun and drinking tea and talking among themselves and I was sitting among them. And suddenly the attention of the women turns to me, a young, healthy, uh, yeah, was it? Uh, men in their company of women who had been very much damaged by uh, surgery and by, by uh, immune chemotherapy uh, and were of course aware of them once a young man enters. So their attention turns on me and says, who are you? I said my name and they said, oh, why don't you sing for us? You're Neil Diamond. Uh -huh. Why don't you get on the table and dance for us? <laughs> and I did, I think the best which, what you can do in such a situation, uh, or can be in such a situation, I was very timid. I blushed, I stammered, uh, but intuitively I was in such an inescapable superior position to them. Being healthy, being undamaged, uh, having the right to go back in an hour to wherever I wanted to go not going to die in the foreseeable future. And it was none of my fault, except that I was there. So what you can do is the, the equivalent of humility, which is act child. So I said, no, I'm not going to dance and sing for you. But I was in a way grateful that they took revenge on me and showed their collective power over me by making me a little bit ridiculous because 
I certainly didn't look the part of, I think it was Neil Diamond in the 70s, yeah. Uh, so once having established a certain kind of power over me, it was much easier to talk. But there are all sorts of fantasies going on, uh, me about them and their bodies, their damaged bodies, of which I was afraid. I was also very afraid of cancer. And then probably the, about this attractive young man uh, and what he might think of them and what he might say about them later. There was a lot at stake. This disfigurement approaching death. And they solved it in this way, which I think was a good solution. The research was about, uh, we had the idea that the hospital, we were supposed to do research with the patients, but we decided to do research with the whole staff, the, 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 the uh, nurses and uh, medical staff, junior doctors, the senior doctors, the patients as if they were a tribe which was organized about the idea of fear, anxiety of death. And that everyone in the hospital had to find a way to cope with, the, uh, with this huge anxiety. And that many of the ways people interacted with each other were means to, co to, to control this pervasive anxiety. Well, that was not to the liking of the specialists. <laughs> we're not they were not afraid at all. And so this the, the final report became the first forbidden books in the Netherlands. I think, still think it's the only forbidden books I know of. But to this day, it is prohibited. You can just look at it. You cannot look into it. Because I'm the only one person who must, I think, pay a million guilders if I pass it on to you. <laughs> Can I please have it? Not from anybody, but not from me. It is in, I saw it's in the corner of the Bibliothek, but it may not be, it may be consulted by special permission only. Well, uh, I'm of course very proud to have a prohibited book on my publication. <laughs> uh, but again, it shows uh, the tensions in, for example, uh, having a rather daring interpretation of what is going on in the hospital uh, as a way to, to control pervasive fear, uh, the stakes are high because somehow they take the rug from underneath the, the, the leaders and the senior specialists as if what they were doing was just some kind of a tribal dance, which by the way is not what I was, we were saying. There's a lot I would like to, 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 to say, but I have more material than time allows. Yeah, I want to, to, to mention one thing, and that is about this, this unconscious fantasies. Nowadays, in most psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, we no longer believe, this is a funny we, because I'm not part of that community anymore, we no longer believe that uh, there are psychological contents that are inaccessible to the mind. So the idea that there may be certain memories which are inaccessible forever, and yet are strong memories, is generally discarded. This very much turns about around memories of uh, sexual abuse of young children, by parents or caretakers, which were at the beginning of psychoanalysis when Freud had a lot of reports of young women who told him about having been sexually abused by fathers or uncles. And initially Freud take, took that for real. And then came a moment in his therapy that he decided that these were not real memories, but were fantasies which also turned around him in a way, inviting fantasies. This is a crucial moment because the feminist movement of the 80s <coughs> then accused him of ignoring, turning a blind eye to so many real instances of sexual abuse in childhood years. I won't pronounce on it. There are two sides to it. There is the transference fantasy about being seduced, and there is a real memory. 
But what we generally don't believe is that such memories have become inaccessible. They are, yeah, where are they? They are uh, on the edge of my, they are almost on my tongue, but I can't quite say them. Whenever I think of them, I, I get sleepy when people start to talk about something else. Uh, there is a fantastic moment in Alexander Munninghoff's book about, he's from a Nazi family, they're all sitting around after the war. He's been up in the attic as a three-year-old. He's put up a big Stahlhelm, an SS helm. He comes down with his SS helm, and the entire family panics and decides to have coffee. Because the little boy is betraying the family secrets. Uh, so, one of the most difficult questions is, where is this? Where are these? unaware, so-called unconscious memories, fantasies. Well, they're very close, but just beyond grasp. I'll give you an example of what I call a shutter moment. A shutter moment is a moment when the camera opens its shutter and suddenly gives you a look inside of you for one tenth of a second. I'll give you one of those moments. You have a serious complaint. It's really something very funny. It hurts, it thick, it's hard. You really, really are nervous about what the hell this can be. You have an appointment in the hospital. You're waiting for the specialist to see you. You've been waiting for 30 minutes. It's really, really unsettling. The door opens, and there she is, a young black woman in a white coat. And for one tenth of a second, you think, I don't want a young black woman in, in a white coat. I want an elderly, gray-haired gentleman in a white coat to treat me. <laughs> but that's the way it works. Uh, not because you are a racist and an incurable uh, bigot, but because you live in a society that is organized like that and you've been part of it for 30, 40, or in my case, even 76 years. And it's in you. I told this to an audience of Sudanese people, a little bit nervous, and they burst out laughing. Yeah. yeah. And there's something at stake, your health. And suddenly you discover ideas, thoughts, and fantasies which are not supposed to be there, but they are in society. <laughs> Should you get rid of those fantasies? No, not at all. They're silly, they're stupid, they're ridiculous, but they're there. And you should try and not to act upon it. And chances are that if you're aware of these uh, kronkels van de geest, kronkels, 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 <laughs> well, let me say knots of the mind, they will not guide you in your actions and opinions, but you are able to ever full of them. Uh, well, this time we'll have an, an, uh, some time to for questions, and I can raise some issues. So I'll stop it right in the middle. Thank you. Outside, but we'll have some time to the village. If you were so lucky that you could sit in in one such a meeting, you would get some ideas of why this exists, and by the way, why this is reproduced by women, for all sorts of reasons in which male power is the decisive element, but it's women who take their little daughters to elderly women in the village. Uh, so you listen, quietly, modestly, and maybe you will understand more. It's very hard to do studies which say that it's gone down from 90 to 14 percent and say, I don't believe that. I don't believe it. Um, and why, who cares, in a way? Maybe we should say everywhere in Senegal there are these discussion circles and women are taking the courage, and some men support them, that yes, this is not really necessary, that this was something of the ancestors and now we can do it differently. Uh, that's, that is what is going on. Uh, why need, do, do we really need more? But these figures make, I don't <coughs> trust them. I don't think they are valid in any way. Okay. 
Well, thank you, Brom. I have a question because in your description of the mechanisms of transference and countertransference, uh, you now seem to present them as mostly problems for research. Uh, but wouldn't it also be possible to see this as sort of ways to, as, as instruments, as way to get information and to sort of, well, in a sense, manipulate people into getting, giving you more information. So isn't there the other side where it's actually a, a tool? I mean, Freud in his original conception of transference considered it the key to, to the cure because it would reproduce early childhood conflicts by projecting them onto this empty, sanitized, psychoanalytic situation. Counter-transference, I think he always discusses, well, he discusses it very rarely, uh, but when he mentioned it, it's always something that must be overcome by long training and experience. Now, a cue. Why would Freud be so very loath to discuss counter-transference and mention it only so rarely? Yeah, but what is, what's the unique thing about Freud among psychoanalysts? Yeah, yeah but he, he analyzed himself. So yes, he's a wild analyst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has not been <laughs> trained. Yeah. And he says that you need long training to overcome, and otherwise it's called wild an analysis. So this is a little embarrassing point for him. <laughs> and on the one hand, it's his greatest discovery, but it puts him in a very tight spot. But also, if you are able like, for example, the, the psychiatrist which I mentioned, uh, who immediately came up with his wartime experiences. I didn't have the heart to say to him, shut up, I'm not asking you anything. But probably he was a pretty good analyst. He may have thought about it himself, why the hell was that suddenly... And he may have discovered, for example, the enormous sympathy for this rather vulnerable young man with this past or whatever, his furor curandi, uh, his, his commitment to heal this young person, I'm still giving very positive fantasies about him. Because in my transference, I ascribed him a daughter. He had a daughter. And I could describe the daughter in detail. And only later I realized that as a, a little child, I had a stepsister who was nine years older than I was. And I was exactly the, describing this daughter with many details who did I still don't know whether she existed, but uh, so probably my transference was he was a good stepfather and he didn't want to destroy that. By the way, he was a very nice stepfather. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for your, for your talk. You, you mentioned the subconscious as a, as a very tricky uh, concept to get our heads around. Yes. And in, and in a way of trying to demarcate it a little bit. Could you talk a little bit about the subconscious versus uh, taken for granted knowledge such as is captured by Garfinkel or, yeah. or Schutz? Yeah. And I guess there must be some overlap but obviously in some ways also very very different. Um, yeah. And I just thought it would be useful, well certainly for me, just yeah. to hear you talk a bit about that. I think the idea that there's an entire world of what you call taken for granted implicit knowledge uh, Uh, in Dutch I say, we kunnen het, maar we kennen het niet. You can walk, yeah. but if you think how you walk, yeah. Yeah. you no longer can move your legs. Yeah. Uh, so there's a world of implicit knowledge. But in general, there is no resistance against ex explicitizing it. Uh, Garfinkel or Gottman were it not uh, ostracized. No, uh, yeah, once you hear it, it's right. Yeah. That's the interesting about the most implicit knowledge. Once you hear it, gee, yeah, that's right. I never thought of it. But there's no resistance. Uh, what you call unconscious or subconscious, most of these words have fallen into disuse completely. But it's generally accessible, but it's surrounded with anxiety and shame. For example, the fantasy about the medical specialist is embarrassing. You don't want to be somebody with those fantasies. Uh, so there is a little resistance against thinking it. But suddenly there is this little flashlight of your inner camera and you see it. And then 
you put it out of your mind, an active word. Er macht sich nicht wissen. He makes himself not knowing it. Uh, oh no, I'm totally colorblind. I don't have these things. No, for me it doesn't matter. Huh? Uh, whether she's uh, uh, black or red, or there are no red or blue people. Yeah. Um, so I'm very much in favor of describing what we call the unconsciousness in terms of active words. It's an idea of Roy Schaefer in the language of psychoanalysis, one of the best books ever written about psychoanalysis, who proposes not to talk about the subconscious or the superego, but to use verbs and, uh, and uh, adverbs. So he was uh, actively trying not to think of his anger about his mother deserting him, as, that sort of thing. Uh, I really don't know how to handle There was a discussion which some of you may have followed between Evelyn Hans and Bart van der Boom, Isfarsje and uh, um, Etzel, uh, Remco. Etzel. Etzel. And it was all about a book Bart van der Boom had written, which was called They Weten Nichts von Hun Lot. We know nothing about their destiny in the present. And it was about uh, it was uh, about diaries by Dutch people, Jews and non-Jews alike, who had kept a diary during the war years. The Institute for War Documentation is 2,500 of those, and from the world studied very seriously 170, and come to the conclusion that no one knew what was going to happen with the deported Jews. No one. He's very strong about it. Uh, I had into that discussion because I spoke before my turn and then I had to read up and be serious. Uh, and um, I said, we don't really know what knowing is. For example, there's this famous passage, he says in 24 in Anna Frank's diary, where he says, Papa says that he heard on the BBC through a Mies reported it, uh, that we are all going to be killed. Well, at least it will be a fast death. Uh, I was wondering what Peter thought about me. Immediately, she ch it will be a fast death, which is a very strange comfort. Very strange. And then she talks about something else. Obviously, did she know? Yeah, she knew. She took the trouble to write it down. But she, in no way, took the consequences of that unbearable knowledge and decided to ignore it again. Um, so we don't know what knowing is. What could she do? She was already in hiding. Would she, should she have committed suicide, run into the street? What the hell can you do? She so, didn't allow it to sink in? Was that, would that be an expression you would? Sorry? She didn't allow it to sink in? Th that would yeah. be, yeah. She didn't reflect on it. She didn't think about it. It did not become part of her. But it was somewhere there. And we have very detailed uh, memories by Lou de Jong, about, who was in London as, uh, with Radio Nell, very well informed. And there were moments that the, the Allied forces actually, so, so many words said what was going on. Even in late 1942, early 1943, he could not have not known. His family was over in, uh, deported in the East, but he never gave the matter a thought. He's a historian and a reporter. And, uh, he told Herr Brandi, our then Prime Minister, and they never talked about it again. Yeah, what do you, this is really difficult. How do you do it? And then later in his, his, his memoirs, he thinks about that and talks it. He couldn't bear the thought of this. I had the chance to talk to Dominique Schnapper, who is the daughter of Raymond Aron one of the most learned and most perceptive, incisive minds of post-war France. 
He also was with Radio France, uh, Radio Libre France, in London as a reporter and a major figure. And Aron says, categorically, he didn't know. And then I told Dominique, his daughter, their daughter, daughter, about Rudy Young. And she got very angry at me. <laughs> she almost threw me out of her. Uh, and nevertheless, nevertheless, so what can we do with it? I think that the idea um, that you know something what you don't know, uh, or you know not something what you know, which are a little bit Sartrean phrases, yep. and connected to Sartre's idea of mauvaise foi, uh, are very helpful. Uh, and that you can put things out of your mind. But the very act of putting them out of your mind puts them into it also. But you can try to think. I'm very interested in collective repression, if you want to call it repression. And Yolande Witthaus wrote a book uh, about the women of Ravensbrück. Ravensbrück was one of the worst camps during the time. And women from the resistance, many communist women, uh, were there, and it was too bad, it was awful. They later uh, came together as the Frau von Ravensbrück <coughs> club, which was very much dominated by communists, and they had a secret, which Yolanda discovered. At liberation, the great patriotic Red Army liberated. These were, came from the Soviet Union, to which they had devoted their wake, uh, waking thoughts, for, whom they had, for which they had risked their lives, and the soldiers raped them at liberation in the terrible state they were in. That happened. And somehow, this did not happen. They did not talk about this. Yolanda never heard about it until she started to talk with some of the women privately, slowly, 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 and the secret came out. But in the congregation, when they were together, this has not happened. And the fact that it did not happen could not be said. And again, you imagine what is at stake. We're not talking about just some fluffy life thing. This was a total dissolution. Yeah, Yolanda discovered this case of collective repression. I think it's a very important discovery for which she is hardly credited. Since we... Uh, do we have some... Yeah. Uh, we have until... Um, okay. uh, let me... I've been on painful grounds all the time. Let me stay there. Many of you here are, have been part of the Elias conflict. Elias had a secret, which he wasn't even all that secretive about in his life. He was homosexual. And the fact that I say this, I always add that, is that one of his very, very best friends, Bram von Stoke, on his deathbed, said to me, Bram, we both call Bram, I want to tell you to the world, Bram von Stoke was openly homosexual, that Norbert was one of us that he was homosexual. I said, okay, I will do that, but it's your wish now that you are approaching death. And quite quickly, there came a book with memories of Robert Elias, and I mentioned this. And I think that was the only time it was mentioned in print. But, although the circle of uh, followers of Elias, there were many homos openly homosexual people, there was absolutely no prejudice whatsoever about homosexuality, and yet it was never mentioned. It was mentioned sometimes. There was, were two members from another country who said very homophobic things during dinner, and nobody reacted. It was really rude. And when one honorable member from still another country got a little old, drunk at the late, in the early hours. He uh, whispered to me, 
<laughs> Nobody will say that. Oh, thank you. Uh, so this is, these are health secrets. And if I had mentioned it to you or to you, we would simply have said, yeah, well, of course, what's the matter? Most likely he is gay. Huh? But we didn't. Now, some of the people are present here who can uh, confirm it. So this was not so much a matter of secretiveness or repression in the traditional sense of Sigmund Freud. It was more unmentionable. And it being unmentionable also made it unthinkable. But I remember the first 30 seconds that I met Norbert Elias. Norbert said to me, are you a dancer? <laughs> hey, look, I had been hitchhiking. I knew what that meant. The next question would be, do you want to see my Japanese etchings? <laughs> uh, do you like ballet? <laughs> but the moment he said it, I thought, he's not saying this. This must be something different. And I did long interviews with it, in which there were cues for his homosexuality. And then I decided not to ask any further. I asked him, where you married? And then he uh, had a long discourse in which it was unclear whether he had lived with a man or a woman. But I didn't ask. So this is not strong repression, but it is how, cer how certain inconvenient facts are being handled. We were being discreet. We were being correct. We were being nice. And in a way, it wasn't necessary at all. But I think it was Norbert's wish, unspoken wish, which we all somehow honored. So very often, repression, unconscious, collective, unconscious, look like, looks like sleepiness. You just don't mention it. And why was Bram van Stolk so eager to tell you? Because he wanted to join Norbert in his, uh, what, in his dialogue. Yes, I guess so. And they had, here I have to be discreet. Let me say they were good friends. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah. All right. So again, there are things at stake. The reputation of your master teacher, which in liberal Holland was in, we say, in no way diminished, but maybe it was a little bit diminished. Maybe now we suddenly all think a little less about Robert Elias. Because he was gay. Or because he was secretive. Because no matter how liberal we are, we are not entirely liberated. It's still a thing to be gay. One more question. I would have another question, but I, if someone, okay, I have a question because you just now mentioned repression several times, mm -hmm. and I think that is, in in thinking about Freud and psychoanalysis, yeah. psychoanalysis is important. I think it's also one of the places where psychoanalysis and social research are have something in common. But I think it's also in both. It's the biggest problem. So what psychoanalysts do is what social scientists do, also uncover things uh, that people don't want to believe about themselves. Uh, so I have two questions. So one is, uh, how do you see this sort of act of uncovering things that people don't want to believe about themselves? And the second problem, which is, of course, the issue with psychoanalysis and also sometimes with social science, is uh, how do you know that it is true? Uh, the problem in both cases, so I'm not a racist. <laughs> of course not. of course we're not racist. So these are the sort of the responses that you get. So how do you get from sort of dealing with repressed or forgotten or half sleepy knowledge? And how can you be sure? And what do you know what do you do when uh, people disagree? Which happens, right? Well there uh, may be two problems. Self knowledge mm -hmm. and ascription. So in self-knowledge, maybe it's not such a good idea to say, I'm not a racist, color doesn't matter for me, I am completely free of these horrible prejudices. Maybe you should say, I live in a society which has structurally a colonial past, a past of racial difference, a past of racial prosecution. It would be very, very strange if that not somehow left its traces in me. The fact that that is so isn't so bad. You should Okay, that is one of those things. Uh, 
So let me look at myself and see what funny prejudices I have. Isn't that amazing? So look, I have all these liberal opinions and nevertheless uh, this or that. So you should have a very forgiving approach to yourself as irreparably a member of society. That's our whole message in social science is that we are created by the society we live in. So take it seriously. Words and all. Words and all. Uh -huh. uh, and if you find out that you have prejudices against women, who cares?